that you've consented. Mm -hmm. Okay, hello everybody and welcome to our lecture series here in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the University of Macau. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Rio Tanaka. Professor Rio Tanaka is a postdoctoral researcher right now in philosophy based at the University of Tokyo. He specializes in various topics in the analytic philosophical tradition, focusing in areas like philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, sometimes ethics. He's got a number of works in progress right now, things dealing with skeptical puzzles surrounding self-knowledge, issues in philosophy of language like semantic externalism or content externalism, issues pertaining to the works of Saul Kripke and Ludwig Wittgenstein, Frege, and so on and so forth, these kinds of towering figures in the analytic tradition. Today, Professor Tanaka is presenting a talk to us titled The Problem of Contingency for the Descriptivist Account of Semantic Deference. As is pretty standard, he's going to have anywhere between 50 and 60 minutes to speak, followed by anywhere between 30 and 40 minutes of Q&A. And then we will call this meeting to a close. Uh, you will notice, of course, that today we are not in our usual uh, in-person meeting place, so there is no uh, meeting at the Port Club downstairs after the fact. Just keep that in mind. Uh, with that, I would ask us to maybe use the, the emoji function uh, to maybe collectively welcome Professor Tanaka, and then I will uh, hand things over. All right. Um, so thanks very much for your introduction, Ben, and thank you very much for everyone for coming to my talk today. Um, okay, so let's get started. And as Ben just told you guys, I'm kind of specialized in um, philosophy of language and mind, especially in the analytic tradition. And the title of my talk today is The Problem of Contingency for the Descriptivist Account of Semantic Difference. And I don't really know that how many of you are familiar with this kind of philosophy of language stuff in the analytic tradition. And so I think I wanna go a little bit slowly today, especially at the beginning of the talk to introduce some background knowledge that's necessary for, well, introducing the topic that I'm going to engage with in my topic, uh, in my talk. Okay, um, I mean, there are a lot of, technical terms in the title of my talk. So I'm gonna take some time to explain what semantic difference is and what the descript what it takes to give a descriptive account of semant semantic differences. Okay, um, so let me get started. Um, so again, the title of my talk is The Problem of Contingency for the Descriptivist Account of Semantic Difference. This is a talk in philosophy of language. And well, as an introduction, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to take some time to introduce the notion of semantic difference. And I'm going to survey some literature and explain how it has been discussed in the 20th and 21st centuries analytic philosophy. And after that short introduction, I'm gonna explain what I'm going to do in my talk and get to the rest of the discussion. Uh, so that's my plan for today. Um, so if you already if you are already familiar with this stuff, I mean externalism and semantic difference and so on, then you might find the first part of the talk a little bit boring. But please bear with me. I just want to make sure that everywhere everyone is on the same board. Okay, um, so first, what is semantic difference? This is going to be one of the key notions in my talk. What is it? Uh, I'm gonna explain it. And so to introduce the notion of semantic uh, difference, uh, I wanna follow uh, Hilary Putnam's dis discussion and I wanna begin by posing this uh, seemingly simple question. Uh, do you know what ELM means, I mean, this is a question about your knowledge of the meaning of this term, ELM. Do you think you know the meaning of this term, ELM? Um, 
if you're a competent speaker of English, you might say yes. And if you pose this question to a typical American or Canadian who speaks English, they may answer probably yes. I mean, ELM is not a very complicated or difficult term for speakers of English. Um, so it refers to some kind of tree. ELM is a name of a, some kind of tree. And here's an ELM tree. That's what this means. Uh, believe me, uh, this is an ELM tree. I took this picture from Wikipedia. Um, so let's say your answer to this first question is yes. Uh, what about this second uh, question? Do you know how ELM is different from beach? Do you know the difference between ELM and beach? Um, to this question, perhaps you answer no. And I would definitely say no to this question. I don't know the difference between elm and beach. I know that elm refers to some kind of tree. And beach also refers to some kind of tree. But I can't say anything specific about how one differs from the other. OK, so what does this mean? I mean, most people would answer yes to the first question, but with the answer no to the second question, uh, what does this mean? Uh, it seems like it means, well, most people's conception of the meaning of ELM isn't specific enough to determine its referent. So your conception of the meaning of ELM isn't specific enough and it doesn't make, uh, you can't rely on your conception of ELM to distinguish ELM trees from beech trees, right? But at the same time, well, does this mean that elm and beach mean the same when they are uttered in your mouth? Uh, we wouldn't want to say yes to this because elm and beach are different words and then they have different meanings. Okay, so even though you can't tell the difference between elm and beach, still elm and beach mean different things and elm, differ, elm refers to one kind of tree and beach refers to the other kind of tree. So there are differences, they have different meanings. And if I, well, describe the situation in this way, you might find it a little bit puzzling. I mean, how is this possible? I myself cannot make the difference between elm and beach, but elm and beach, these two terms uttered in my mouth mean different things. Um, how is this possible? And semantic difference was first introduced as a notion that seems to provide some sort of answer to this question. How is this possible? Um, so I'm following the classical discussion by Putnam and Burge here. Uh, they are philosophers of language in the 20th century America. So to generalize from the previous example a little bit, it seems like, well, in general, ordinary speakers understanding or conceptions of the meanings of the words can be, well, let's say defective in many sorts of ways. So as we saw with the previous example, one's conception of the meaning of a word can be incomplete, meaning that it's not specific enough to determine its referent. So for instance, you don't know, most people don't know the difference between beach and elm. Um, there are other ways in which your conceptions of the meanings can be defective. Um, so for example, your conception of the meaning of a certain term could be confused a little bit. So for instance, well, this is a common mistake among many people, but you might believe that, well, contract does not apply to an oral agreement. So you might believe that in order to make a contract, you have to sign on some formal document. But according to the lawyers, uh, this is a mistake. You can make a contract just by making some kind of oral agreement. You don't have to sign on the paper necessarily. So your conception of the meaning of contract could be confused or uh, your conception of the meaning of some term may be well, idiosyncratic in the sense that it's not shared by other people in the linguistic community. 
So, well, take this example. Uh, for instance, think about the child who recognizes the referent of whiskey only as some kind of liquid that dad drinks at dinner. Okay, so this is one way of correctly identifying the referent of whiskey. This is, there's nothing wrong about this description, but it's highly idiosyncratic in the sense that it's not shared by many members of the linguistic community. Okay, so as we just saw, our conception, individual, individual speakers' conceptions of the meanings are sometimes flawed, or there are mis sometimes there are mismatches between them. But nonetheless, it seems like we can share meaning. That is, we can talk about the same thing, the same object, or the same subject matter by using the same word. All right, so even if your conception of contract is a little bit confused, you can still talk about your contract with your lawyer. Okay, we can share meaning. And as I said, semantic difference, the notion of semantic difference has been introduced to provide some sort of explanation for how this is possible. I mean, despite individual flaws and in interpersonal variances, we can share meaning. There is the fact of co-reference, I'm going to call it as I'm going to call it, uh, by the fact of co-reference, I just mean the fact that we can talk about the same thing by using the same word. Um, so what is semantic difference? Um, so here's some sort of definition of the notion of semantic difference. I'm just going to read it. Uh, semantic difference is a practice whereby the referent of a term in an ordinary speaker's vocabulary is determined by the use of the term by a group of speakers who are more knowledgeable about the subject matter. And this group of speakers are called experts. Uh, let me explain. Um, I don't really know I have to visualize this, but here's some kind of diagram to show what's going on here. Um, so A, B, C, D, uh, these are, well, let's say ordinary speakers. And they may not they they may not necessarily know the difference between elm and beach, for example. So their conceptions of the meanings can be vague or confused or idiosyncratic, but they can talk about the same kind of tree by using the same term, elm or beach. How is this possible? Um, it's possible according to this view because in our linguistic community. There are some expert speakers who know more about the relevant three kinds better than us. Okay, so these are the expert speakers. And in the case of, I mean, plant terms like elm and beach, these experts will be um, plant researchers, botanists. Okay, so these people can tell the difference between elm and beach, and they can provide more precise and specific definitions for plant terms like elm and beach. So the meanings or the reference of these plant terms get determined by their use. And ordinary speakers use of the relevant plant terms are is um, kind of parasitic on the use of expert speakers. That's the idea of semantic difference. So ordinary speakers semantically differ to some group of experts. Uh, who can determine the meanings for the rest of speakers in the linguistic community. That's the idea of semantic difference. Okay. So as I said, Hilary Putnam was one of the first people to address this issue in philosophy of language uh, literature. And he argued that well, there is this phenomenon of semantic difference in our linguistic community. And what does this show? Uh, he argued that, well, if we want to give a proper account of this phenomenon, semantic difference, he argued that we need to adopt some form of the view that he called semantic externalism. And this semantic externalism um, is kind of characterized by this 
slogan like phrase meaning just ain't in the head. This is Padnam's kind of famous phrase. So more precisely, what the view says is that the meanings of linguistic expressions are determined by factors external to individual speakers. So in other words, the meanings are not reducible to individual speakers' psychological states. So the referent of your word is determined independently of your conception of its referent. In other words, uh, there can be a mismatch between what the referent of a word really is and what you take the referent of the word to be. Okay, there is an objective meaning determined by some so sort of social mechanism and your there is your subjective take on what the meaning is and there can be a mismatch between these two. That's the basic idea. Okay, um, Patam also said that, well, he doesn't really give us the details of his idea, but he said that there is a structured cooperation in the linguistic community between expert speakers who get to determine the meanings for relevant terms and ordinary speakers. And because of this structured cooperation in the linguistic community, we can share meaning. Uh, in other words, we can talk about the same thing by using the same set, by using the same word, despite our individual flaws and variances, differences in our conceptions of the meanings. Okay, so that's the idea of semantic difference and semantic externalism. Um, well, I could say a few words about how the topic is relevant to the recent discussion in epistemology, but um, I'm gonna skip this slide in the interest of time. Um, so I hope everyone kind of gets the basic idea of semantic uh, difference and also the, the semantic externalism. And as I said, uh, this is a brief survey of the literature so far. Um, as I said, Padnam was one of the first people to address this, is this issue of semantic difference explicitly. So. Putnam's view has become kind of the orthodox view on this issue. So many people believe that Putnam's discussion shows that meanings aren't in individual speakers' heads. But of course, there are people who disagree with this orthodoxy. So they are internalists. So they don't like the idea that meanings aren't in the head. They want to insist on the idea that meanings are somehow reducible to individual people's psychology. Okay, so they, well, they accept that there is this phenomenon of semantic difference, but they argue that, well, the moral to draw from Padnam's discussion of semantic difference is not to accept the idea that meanings ain't in the head. Okay, so it doesn't show that the semantic externalism is true because there is a perfectly good internalist account of semantic difference. And they insist on the idea that semantic difference is reducible to speaker's internal conceptions of meaning. Um, so this is a quick survey of the literature. There has been a debate as to how to interpret Panam's discussion on semantic difference. Does that show semantic externalism is true or not? There has been a debate. And against this, background, what I want to do in my talk is to, well, establish these two claims. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce an internalist account of semantic difference and argue that, well, it has a serious problem that I call the problem of contingency. That's the first claim I want to establish in my talk. There is a problem for any internalist attempt of um, explaining semantic difference. And the second, well, I will argue that to deal with this problem of contingency, uh, we will, after all, have to adopt some form of semantic externalism. That's my second claim. Okay, so first I'm gonna criticize the internalist account of semantic difference. Then I'm gonna briefly propose an alternative account. Okay. Um, so, 
let's get to the second section where I'm going to introduce an internal risk account of semantic difference. Um, so in a recent paper um, by Joy Pollock, uh, it was published in 2021. It's called Content Internalism and Testimonial Knowledge. And well, she kind of proposes an internalist account of semantic difference. So she argues that we don't need to adapt semantic externalism to give a proper account of semantic difference. And she, well, she relies on this idea which she calls descriptivism about reference determination. And this is a form of internalism. Okay, it's a, actually a very simple view. So I'm gonna read it. Uh, the view that the reference of an expression, linguistic expression, such as a name for a speaker, is determined by a description that's associated with the expression by that speaker. Okay, um, so the idea is that within each speaker's mind, there is a description associated with a linguistic expression and the referent of that expression is determined by that description and nothing else because she endorses internalism. Okay, and again, our task is to explain how it is possible to share meaning within the linguistic community despite individual differences and conceptions. Um, speakers' reference fixing descriptions should meet at least these two conditions. First, uh, speakers' reference fixing descriptions should be able to determine reference correctly for, in the first place. So they should be able to distinguish Elm from Beach. And second, and uh, because there is data that we can talk about the same thing by using the same word. And um, so the second condition that should be cleared is that, well, these kind of descriptions should be in fact psychologically shared by ordinary speakers. Uh, this, these are intentionally formulated in very abstract ways. So I'm gonna um, explain these by using some examples right away. Okay, um, so the idea is actually very simple. So internalists argue that there is a perfectly good internalist account of semantic difference. Um, I'm just gonna read it. So a referential expression C, some word C, in a speaker's vocabulary refers to whatever kind or object it refers to in the expert's vocabulary. If S, the speaker cognitively associates a description such as follows with, uh, such as follows with this, linguistic expression. And it's called a differential description. C is whichever object the actual experts in our linguistic community talk about with tokenings of C. Um, so what are they claiming here? Uh, the claim is that this kind of description is stored in each speaker in our linguistic community. Okay, so this is a fully internalist account of semantic difference. Semantic difference occurs because each speaker in our community associates this kind of differential descriptions with terms like elm and beach and contract and so on. Okay, it's a matter of their psychological descriptions. Um, so this is again a fully internalist account and this well, so we wanted to explain how we can share meaning, how we can share reference. It's explained by virtue of people sharing descriptions that pick out the same reference. Okay, so the fact of co-reference is explained by people sharing this description at their psychological level. So this is the internalist treatment of semantic differences that I'm going to criticize in my talk. Um, so to explain this treatment, internalist treatment of semantic difference a little bit more carefully, I wanna say a few words about what the view implies. 
so again, the claim is that in each individual speaker's mind, there is a description that picks out some expert who can determine the meaning for each term. And well, this is a claim about individual speaker's psychology. So for any term, there is, well, whether such a description is stored in the individual speaker's minds or not is a purely empirical contingent matter. Okay, so it is a purely contingent matter whether a speaker really associates a differential description with any given term. Okay, so in principle, you have to look into people's minds to if this is true. Uh, but um, internalists argue that, well, as a matter of fact, well, there is a reasonable, well, it is a reasonable assumption to believe that some kind of differential description is actually typically shared by competent speakers. And this is an empirical claim about people's psychology. And uh, something like this claim has been advanced explici explicitly by people like Hartley Field. And well, this is again a purely empirical matter. So, well, you gotta be able to tell some kind of story about how people have been have come to associate such a differential description for each term. So here's one possible very rough story. So perhaps when speakers acquire relevant terms like beach, elm, and contract, they are also trained to defer to some experts in the community. Okay, so it's just an empirical hypothesis, but maybe a reasonable one. Okay, and they also argue to make their view more plausible. They also argue that a speaker's acceptance of a differential description can be implicit rather than explicit. Um, and this claim has been made in response to some common objection to the internalist treatment of semantic difference. Okay, um, so let me go back a few pages. So if you look at this description, differential description, the claim is that this description is associated with each term in individual speakers' minds, but you might find that claim um, implausible, empirically speaking, because, well, no ordinary speaker of English has the concept like tokenings or experts, right? So this is how philosopher would talk about the reference determination. And it is implausible to think that any competent English speaker actually explicitly has the belief of this form with this content. It's highly implausible. Okay, children can talk about Elm and Beach, but the children do not have the concept of talkings or experts. Um, it is because of this kind of objection that internalists argue that a speaker's acceptance of a differential description can be implicit. So they argue that, well, their acceptance of a differential description needs to be manifest in the speaker's linguistic behaviors, and it is, on, it is what's only needed. So, the idea is that the fact that we accept some sort of differential descriptions is manifested in how we behave and what we say about the meanings of some linguistic expressions. So for instance, um, you may have a disposition to accept the lawyer's correction. An oral agreement can also qualify as a contract. So you recognize your lawyer as some kind of authority about the legal issues, and you acknowledge that your belief that a contract can only be made by signing on some kind of formal document was mistaken, okay? You have a disposition to defer, actually defer to your lawyers about the, le the meanings of legal terms. Okay, and, and people's acceptance of the differential description is kind of reflected in things people tend to say about the meaning of some terms. 
So this is a perfectly normal phrase for someone to say about the computer they are trying to buy. So some person might say, I haven't a clue what RAM is, but I know that the new PC I am buying has 32 of whatever it is that computer people use the term for. Okay, so it seems like a person who utters this sentence knows that people who know more about the meaning of RAM and the person should defer to these people to let them determine the meaning of this term RAM. And it seems like this person is explicitly deferring to computer people, whoever they are, to let them determine the meaning of this term. Okay, um, so this is another kind of implication of a descriptivist account. From I have a few, I have a lot, I have said a lot about the internalist account of semantic difference. So I, let me just sum up what the view was. So the descriptivist internalist account of semantic difference, it is a fully internalist account with commitments concerning speaker's psychology. The claim is that this kind of this differential description is associated with each term in individual speaker's minds. And they argue that semantic difference occurs because and when individual speakers cognitively associate different differential descriptions with relevant terms. So according to them, um, the fact that semantic difference exists in our linguistic community does not show that semantic externalism is true because there is a perfectly good internalist account of uh, semantic difference, which reduces this phenomenon to the, the description stored in people's, in people's psychology. Okay, um, all right, so I guess I said enough about what the view is, I mean, what the internalist account of semantic difference is. So I'm gonna move on to my criticism of the view. So to formulate my criticism of the internalist account of semantic difference, I wanna begin by posing this very naive question. So experts are mentioned in differential descriptions, right? Uh, C is whatever object or kind that experts are talking about when they use C experts mentioned in differential descriptions, but well, here's a very naive question. Who are the experts mentioned in those descriptions? And should speakers know who the experts are to be able to talk about the relevant objects? And if they don't have to know who the experts are, well, why not? And well, these are important questions, I think, because unless this, these questions are answered, it seems like reference could remain indeterminate. And Frank Jackson, um, I mentioned his name in one of the quotes earlier, I, I think, uh, he's an internalist and he endorses an internalist account of semantic difference. And he kind of acknowledges this point, this problem. So he says, it may be unclear who the experts are in the sense that it is unknown to the ignorant users and yet reference still occurs, he says. So it seems like he's saying, well, as a matter of fact, people do not necessarily know who the relevant experts are, but still reference occurs. So we can share meaning and we can uh, semantically differ to some experts, whoever they are, although we don't know who they are. And well, how can internalists respond to this kind of question? And Jackson actually provides a short answer to this question by appealing to the notion of indirect difference 
So the basic idea is that, well, speakers may not necessarily know who the relevant experts are that they are deferring to, but they can indirectly defer to the experts via some sort of social chains of deference. Um, so I'm going to explain what this means by going through this quote from Jackson. Um, I, I guess I'm just going to read it. So ignorant speakers who don't know the experts are can have a reference determining description such as having the property, the group of users of the word quark that they're borrowing from associate with the word quark. And what property does this second group of users associate with the term quark? Either they are the experts, in which case it is property Q, whatever that is, or they are not the experts, in which case it is having the property some third group of users associate with quark. Um, so I hope the idea is being made clear here. I mean, that notion of indirect difference. So the idea is that there is a kind, we can think about some sort of social chain of difference in the community. And even if you don't know who the relevant experts are that you're deferring to, uh, you can indirectly defer to experts by tracing the chain of um, uh, semantic difference. So let's say this is you. So you don't know who the relevant experts are, but you are borrowing a term from someone else. So you pass it back to that person. Okay, so this person is not an expert either. And this person does not know the, who the relevant experts are either. So this person passes the back to, to the next person and this person knows who the relevant experts are. So this person is directly deferring to some expert on the subject matter. And so this is the expert and the chain stops at this point. So this person determines the meaning of the term like quark. And through this chain of indirect deference, all of these people in the chain can mean the same by using the term like quark. Okay, um, so here's the problem of contingency. So th this is my criticism of this kind of view that appeals to indirect difference. Um, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples later to demonstrate what I'm getting at here, but let me pose the problem in a little bit abstract way first. So this is the problem. Uh, so it seems like well, if you start talking about indirect difference, it seems like different speakers' differential descriptions for some word, W, can directly or indirectly pick out different groups of people as the meaning of determining experts. And when this happens, different reference would be assigned for W for each of these different speakers. And I think this leads to a problem and I'm gonna demonstrate it with a couple of examples soon. Um, but um, I think I wanna draw on David's, Michael David's discussion here to uh, illustrate the concern I am trying to um, present here. So he kind of, he already uh, recognized this kind of problem and he argued or explained that, well, if you start talking about the relation of indirect semantic difference, there could be three types of potentially problematic semantic difference. The first, a speaker associates a differential description with W, but he or she S does not know who he or she is deferring to. So, and the notion of semant indirect semantic difference is supposed to provide some kind of answer to this concern. Also, he points out, a speaker may associate a differential description with W, but defers to non-experts. And lastly, the speaker does not defer to others in fixing a word's referent where S should have done so. Okay, so he doesn't defer to anyone else in the linguistic community where he should have done so. This is the last problematic case of semantic difference. Um, 
so I guess this kind of diagram is helpful here. So this represents the problem that I'm calling the problem of contingency. So let's think about this speaker B and D here. Okay, so they are ignorant speakers, so they can't tell the difference between Elm and Beach, and they are confused about contract and so on. And they know they have to defer to someone, but they don't know who the experts are, so they defer to a person or a group of people where he acquired the word from, okay? And this group of people or this person A differs to experts, the group of experts, let's call them experts one. And if we look at this chain, um, D is deferring to E and D doesn't know who the relevant experts are, but E knows, he thinks knows that who the relevant experts are and he defers to the experts too. And the point is that there are different group of experts in the linguistic community. And B and D, they are unknowingly different to different groups of experts. And as a result, they come to mean different things by using the same word. And that's the problem that I'm calling the problem of contingency. So you can unknowingly defer to some different group than other speakers in your community. And that could lead to a problem as I'm going to uh, explain using a couple of examples. Okay, um, so this is an example. Uh, this is the case one I'm gonna call the conspiracy theorist. Um, so let's think about two people, two ignorant people, Anne and Bob, and the referent of Tiger in Anne's vocabulary is fixed by her description following the internalist account of semantic difference. Tigers are whatever animals that zoologists, I mean, animal researchers classify as tigers. So this is her belief about the meaning of tigers. And Anne's neighbor, Bob, believes the following conspiracy theory about tigers. Uh, so this is a very strange thought experiment, but follow me. Um, so the things that people call tiger are actually robots. Real tigers are almost extinct and are protected by a secret institution located on some isolated island that nobody knows. And the expert we trust can distinguish real tigers from the robots by using some kind of special device. And these people who can distinguish robots from the real tigers know what tiger re really refers to. So they have to determine the meaning of tiger. Bob believes because he believes in this conspiracy theory. So if we follow the descriptivist account, Anne and Bob are talking about different things by using the same term, tiger. Okay, by tiger, Bob is talking about robots that imitate tigers and Ang is talking about the usual tigers. And well, I, I think this may be okay. Uh, so I think the internalist account could give a correct analysis of this case because I mean, Bob has very wild beliefs about tigers. Okay, I, so I think this is fine. I mean, I think this does not necessarily pose a problem for the internalist account. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide in, in the inter interest of time. Um, but I think a case like this would be more problematic for the internalist account of semantic difference. I call this case, my father is a conspiracy theorist. So to put the conclusion first, this is a case where this kind of mismatch that occurred between Ang and Bob occurs due to unintentional, unlucky, unfortunate indirect difference. Okay, so here's the story. Uh, we have Kate and Dave this time. Uh, so both Kate and Dave are willing to defer to some experts in the community to fix the reference of Tiger, but they don't really know who the experts are. And Kate happens to have an encyclopedia of animals in her bookshelf and decides to defer to scholars who supervised its publication. 
So she is, by making this decision, she is deferring to animal experts, animal researchers, zoologists. Dave, unfortunately, I mean, on the other hand, defers to his father, who is a veterinarian, um, pet doctor, and seems to know better about animals than Dave in general. So Dave defers to his father, and to whom does his father defer? Well, unfortunately, unbeknownst to Dave, his father believes a conspiracy theory about tigers. So his father, Dave's father, defers to, well, strange conspiracy believers as the relevant experts who determine the meaning of uh, tiger. And I think case like this will pose a problem for the internalist account of semantic difference. Okay, so if we follow the descriptivist account, tiger would not refer to the same animal kind in Kate and Dave's vocabularies because, I mean, they are captured or trapped in different chains of semantic difference. Kate is indirectly differing to zoologists, but Dave is unfortunately indirectly differing to conspiracy theorists. So they indirectly differ to different groups. So they are talking about different things when using the term like tiger. But I think this is well unintuitive and this is actually problematic because it seems like Dave could still talk about tigers using tiger given that he's not the conspiracy believer himself. So it seems like Kate and Dave can still talk about the tiger by using the term tiger. So if Dave, for instance, says there is a tiger in the backyard, well, it's a report about the animal kind of tiger. It's not about the robot and Kate should, well, she had better run. I mean, so, so there is this intuition that they could still communicate about tigers, the animal kinds by using the same kind of tiger, but it seems like the descriptivist account cannot say that. So this is the problem. Um, so to sum up, I'm, I mean, to summarize, summarize what's going on here, here's the problem of contingency. Um, so the descriptivist account, if I'm right, seems to imply that people are talking past one another sometimes because their differential descriptions pick out different groups as meaning determining experts. And generally, I think what this shows, I mean, these cases show is that on descriptivism, meanings can be easily influenced by contingent factors such as lack or accessibility or social relations or reputation. So what you mean by a certain word can be easily influenced by who you happen to know, to put it really simply. And it's a very contingent factor. And in a way, descriptivism make means very unstable and I think in some cases, this may be okay. I mean, the first case I talked about, it may be okay that descriptivism could give a correct analysis about that case, but it seems like the case like the second one seems to pose a more, uh, it, it is a more problematic case for the internalist account of semantic difference. Okay, um, so I think I have 10 minutes or something left. So. So that was my criticism of the internalist account of semantic difference. So, and, and I think, well, I wanna draw some observations from the cases I discussed in the previous section. I think what these cases shows is that to secure co-reference, I mean, to explain the fact that we can talk about the same thing by using the same term within a wide range of ordinary speakers, to secure that, the reference of their words need to be fixed by who these speakers should defer to rather than who they actually defer to as a matter of fact and as a matter of luck. 
And I submit that a good theory of semantic deference should be able to accommodate this normative aspect of meaning determination. Okay, so in some sense, people should defer to scientists to determine the meanings of plant terms or animal kind terms, and they should not defer to uh, conspiracy believers in some sense. And ignorant ordinary speakers, uh, their meanings, the meanings of their words should be determined in reference to these scientists, not conspiracy believers. That's my proposal or that's my observation here. And I am arguing that a good theory of any adequate theory of semantic difference should be able to accommodate this normative aspect of the meaning determination. And the claim or the question is that, well, can descriptivism deal with this point? Can they accommodate this normative point about meaning determination? And I think that descriptive treatment of semantic difference ultimately fails because uh, it cannot meet this requirement. It cannot accommodate this normative element in meaning determination in the society. Uh, that's my claim. Um, so I think I'm just gonna elaborate on my claim in the rest of my talk. Uh, I have like seven minutes left. Um, Okay, so I think I wanna draw on Derek Ball's recent work uh, summarized in his paper, Metasemantic Ethics. So he kind of addresses the question. He has a kind of concern that's similar to mine. So in that paper, he considers two different ways in which, um, which groups in the society get to determine the meaning of terms. Okay, so here are two different accounts of what it takes to be a meaning determinant, a meaning determining expert in our society. How we choose um, the groups that uh, determine the meanings for the rest of us. And he considers these two possibilities according to the first proposal to be a meaning determinant expert in the society requires only the ability to convince other people, only the ability to influence other people. So the experts are simply those whose testimony we will accept, those who can convince us to adopt their usage. And he calls this the power semantics. There is an, another um, possibility. So to be an expert requires some positive epistemic position with respect to the subject matter. So when it comes to the meaning determination of terms like um, animal kind terms, well, we have to defer to, well, zoologists, scientists. If we adopt this virtue semantics, we could say that, but if we adopt the power semantics instead, then we might allow conspiracy theorists to allow, uh, we, we might allow conspiracy theorists to influence people's uh, use of the linguistic expression to like tigers. So power would allow conspiracy theories to determine reference, but virtue may not. That's my point here. And that's the reason why I am drawing on Bold's work here. Okay, so again, this the, the point is really simple. We have to, as a normal point, we have to defer to scientists rather than uh, conspiracy theorists in determining the meaning of tigers and the task is how to secure that. And it seems like we have to accept some form of the virtue semantics to secure that point. Okay. Um, so I think what this shows, what my discussion so far shows is that well, as we saw in the examples I discussed in the previous section, ordinary speakers are often trapped in inappropriate chains of semantic difference as a model of luck. So they could unintentionally, unknowingly defer to some inappropriate group of people and let them uh, determine the meanings for you. And this is not ideal because this can threat the fact of coreference. It can happen that people are talking past each other because they differ to whole different groups of people. So 
to uniformly assign correct reference for the words used by ordinary speakers. So in other words, to secure the possibility of co-reference among uh, within the linguistic community, some single group of experts should be designated within the linguistic community for each term. And I would say they are the people who should qualify experts rather than the people who happen to be regarded as experts as a matter of contingency. And they are the people who should qualify as experts, judged in light of some reasonable criterion, like the virtue I considered on the previous slide. And my claim, uh, I think I kind of ran out of time, but my claim is that descriptivists cannot implement this strategy because, well, they insist on getting everything into people's individual psychology. Okay, um, so here is a possible descriptivist, descriptivist response to the problem that I just posed. They might argue that, well, we could specify a speaker's differential description in this way. Whatever object that the actual experts are talking about when they use W, where, so this is the trick, the actual expert picks out the speakers that S in an epistemically idealized scenario would pick out as the experts. So for example, well, unfortunately in the real scenario, Dave unfortunately indirectly refers to conspiracy theorists via his, his uh, father, but Dave might not have deferred to his father in the first place had he known that his father was a conspiracy believer. Okay, so if, we take Dave into an idealized, epistemically idealized um, situation, he would not have deferred to his father. So that's a possible descriptivist response. And so I'm gonna quickly explain my objection to this response and wrap up my talk. So this is, I say, a shallow objection. And I'm gonna get to the deeper objection. Um, I think there is a problem with the notion of idealization here. So, well, what determines what a speaker would say in the epistemically idealized scenario? And more specifically, can we hope to find something inside a speaker's head that provides a determinate answer to this kind of question? So if we think about Dave's father, who is a conspiracy theorist, well, let's say we take Dave's father to an epistemically idealized environment, would he stop deferring to conspiracy theorists or not? Um, it's not clear. And I think there is no psychological ground for giving a different answer to this claim. And it seems like without a determinate answer to this question, the referent of Tiger would be indeterminate. And this is, I think, a problem for the internalist account of semantic difference. And this is kind of a shallow objection, maybe a shallow objection to with the notion of idealization, but I think it goes to a deeper point. Um, so I think, I think this is more like a methodological point um, about the basic stance that the descriptivist can take. So my objection can be summarized in the form of this question. Is this response good as a descriptivist response? Is this something that the descript descriptivist should really say? That's my concern because uh, I, I'm kind of running out of time, but I'm gonna try to finish this in two or three minutes. So I think once this kind of idealization is allowed, the descriptivist theory can always get the right result. Uh, this is what I mean. So they can always say something like this. Whatever differential description that appropriate de appropriately determines a word reference should be located in speaker's head somehow. Okay, so this is what they would say in response to kind of counter examples that I discussed in the previous section. And I think, well, this is something that they could say, 
Um, but I think that the cost of making this response is to admit that their descriptivist or internalist theory no longer tracks what speaker actually pick out as the referent of the terms based on their cognitive descriptions. Okay, uh, I kind of wanted to spend more time on this, but I'm running out of time. So if this is not clear, please ask me in the Q&A. And I think this ultimately undermines the original motivation for descriptivism or internalism. So they wanted to defend the idea that meanings are in the head, in individual speakers' minds. And they wanted to insist that they wanted to insist on this claim because they want to explain the connection of a term and its referent in terms of a speaker's psychological ability to pick out the referent by relying on their cognitive descriptions. Okay. So this was the original motivation for internalism or descriptivism, but it seems like once they start talking about this kind of idealization, they are kind of, uh, their view is losing the original merit or benefit that their view had. So that, that's my, I would say a deeper objection to, to uh, the descriptive, descriptivist the response that I discussed. Okay, um, so uh, if I had a time, I would have talked about how an externalist could treat the problem of contingency, but I am running out of time, so I'm gonna skip this slide and please ask me in Q the Q&A if you are interested. And so here are conclusions. Just to, this is just a summary. So co-reference among a wide range of ordinary speakers would not hold if the reference of their words are determined by which groups of speakers they happen to defer to as a matter of fact, because as I argued, um, they could be embedded in this old kind of different chains of indirect semantic difference. And to remedy this, I argued, reference should be fixed by who they should, uh, who they should defer to as a matter of normal fact. And well, I argued, I mean, I examined whether it, if internalists could implement this kind of strategy. I mean, uh, so I argued that modifying the internalist view to deal with problem would undermine, ultimately undermine internalism's original philosophical motivations. And although I didn't have time, externalism can give a better and more straightforward explanation of this normative point about semantic difference. Uh, so that's my conclusion. Okay, so that's it. Thanks very much. And I am sorry that I'm uh, five minutes past. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>